All right, hi. Um, so disclaimer, I'm representing my own views. Um, and this, is talk, this talk is about security. And this is a very vast and complex topic. We're only gonna talk about like a small little slice. And I'm not an expert, right? There's probably something wrong in these slides. Um, so let's go. Okay, so if you take solid state physics and molten sand, you get uh, this, it's like a transistor, and you shrink it a couple million times. Um, and earlier so we saw this nice picture of this like electrical switch. It's very similar. It's like either electricity flows or it doesn't flow. And this like should it flow or should it not flow is also controlled by electricity. So then you stick them together. You get logic gates, these little triangles. They're uh, transistors. Um, then you stick a lot of them together. You get a CPU. And <laughs> of course, that's a gross oversimplification. But like, let's go. OK, so let's look at the first code example. All of this should compile, so I can just take a look. So this is a function. It takes an in pointer, returns an integer, like it loads the value, return and uh, adds three to it. On the right side, we can see the assembly for it. Um, so good, like this. And that's it again. Yeah. Machine language 101, move, morph, move. This is like move memory from one location to another location and add, like add that number to this register. So you, this is Intel assembly, like this is some way of representing this uh, on the right side. So usually like move, for example, goes from, it moves the right thing to the left thing, add, adds the right thing to the left thing, uh, and the red is like return from the function call. And let's imagine we simulate this. So this would be the first cycle, and then that's the second cycle, and what do you think? How could a CPU execute this code faster? So if you imagine like every time we, we flick the switch, something happens. So like let's flick the switch faster. Uh, and that's, <laughs> that's a very basic idea, but it usually works. It does, it makes everything faster. So like imagine this the cycle, like we have this digital signal goes from on to off and like a cycle takes 10 nanoseconds. And then if we reduce that delta, if we make it uh, less, um, everything goes, like a lot of things go faster. Um, but there is a bit of a problem. Yeah, the faster we go, the more power we leak. It's kind of like a physics problem. Um, yeah. So at some point, um, that's us. Um, and we kind of crossed, like we looked over something when we do it, when we, simulated these cycles. So like this is the first cycle. We like loading, like imagine the thing RDI is pointing to is in main memory. Uh, and oops, yeah, oof. Uh, it's 140 cycles that just, uh, that we had to wait for that memory to be available. And that's not even the worst case possible. So and then adding it's pretty, uh, it just takes a single cycle. Um, there's nothing to wait for in that case. Um, so like, let's imagine we have a couple of villages and they're mining stone. Um, and they mine the stone over there and they like, they bring it back to like the town center and like they have to walk all the way all the time. So like, what if you put like a little resource depot there and I like, they don't have to go as far. Um, you could even call this a cache, right? Um, so let's try again with a cache. So we're loading and it's in the cache. Let's say things go well, only 10 cycles, not perfect, but better than before. Of course, reality is more complex. Um, and for what we're gonna talk about, we need to go deeper. Like, this is not just one instruction. This, like, we kind of need to decompose it into like different parts. There's just one way of doing that. So for example, you can say there's a first phase, that's the, the instruction fetch, you're getting the instruction, then you're decoding it, then executing it, you're doing memory accesses and write backs. So it's a very co common model, but this is probably not exactly how your CPU does it, but it's just some way of representing this. So if that's your, our CPU, let's imagine, and it can just, it does one thing after the next. Then that's the first cycle. And we, let's say the value is in a cache, but like you see, we added five cycles just because we had to execute this one instruction. Um, and then adding like also five instructions. Um, how could a CPU execute this faster? This is called pipelining. This is, let's imagine your CPU has only one of each unit. <laughs> Um, but you want to keep each part of the processor busy. 
So you pipeline these operations. You add a bit of latency, but usually it doesn't matter. Like it's just amortized out for the whole execution. Um, and this allows us to like more effectively use every part of the processor. Because we can write back memory and then fetch the next instruction at the same time because there's, not, there's no overlap in what they're doing. Um, so we know around like 2005 there was a stall in uh, clock speeds. So I was online, I was like looking for a picture where I was like, okay, I knew like clock speeds, they didn't keep increasing over time, right? Like at some point they hit a limit. But then I found this helpful graphic, uh, like chart. And um, the nice part is down there and very small, maybe someone can read it. It says updated to 2016. So the original graph was from 2005 and then it's updated 2015 or 16. And the person just drew like extrapolated in the same direction out. And because I don't have a 28 gigahertz CPU, which this thing claims you should have by now. Uh, and maybe there's the book or like the article's name is the, singular the singularity is near when humans transcend biology. It's maybe not the most credible source. So let's <laughs> look at something more, uh, more, more credible. So the br bright blue one in the middle, that's clock speeds. And we can see, yes, around 2005, they're like tapering off and the same one below, that's uh, thermal design power. That's how much power your CPU is using. Um, but there's something curious about this, right? Like there's one graph that like keeps growing and that's transistors. And this one only goes 2015, this one goes 2018. So like this keeps happening. So what are they doing with like all these transistors? Because they just keep cramming more and more into your CPU. And um, I would hope they have some reason for it. Um, so this is kind of a measurement unit. So like we want to say like how many instructions on average could we execute per cycle? So like in our early example, let's say we have three instructions and each instruction took one cycle, then we have one IPC. But if it takes 142 cycles to execute three instructions, then we have much less. And of course, just you can also have more than one. So <laughs> but I mean, we programmers are quite creative. So like we found an easy solution like we can't get more uh, clock speed, but we can very easily get more IPC. Um, and that's kind of the response we got back. I mean, they're not wrong, right? Like, um, it's the programmer's fault the CPU has to wait. So like we, we, like we could write more efficient software that like, like uses the memory layout more efficiently, waits less, doesn't jump around as much, especially like these node style uh, um, data structures, they're really bad in that, that regard. But like, no, <laughs> we're there again. Um, so at some point, yeah, they gave, gave up. Um, and <laughs> they just told us, here you go, you get more IPC. But like, please don't ask how we did it. Uh, and if you look at it, indeed, if you look at like single threaded performance, um, it did increase over time, it's still increasing. So like it's not as good as it used to be. We can see this like oh no moment in, at 2000, uh, around 2005 when they're like oh no we can't flick the switch any faster. Um, so let's take a look. Dun, dun, dun. So now we're good programmers. We have the same program from earlier, but we are checking for a null pointer. Um, and if it's a null pointer, we want to return some default. Otherwise, we want to use that value. Um, yeah, that's, that's essentially it. So let's come back to this. So we have a runtime condition, like a runtime branch, as you can see here. And this one, this test instruction, is like a bitwise AND uh, at the memory location RDI. Um, and So let's say, okay, it took, the value was in the cache, took 10 cycles to load it. Um, then we have this jump instruction that says like jump equal. Uh, we want to go to this label. And we only know where to go once the value is loaded, right? Like we have this runtime condition. We don't know at compile time. We have to decide during, uh, during runtime. This is represented here. We do a test and then we do a jump based on the result of that test. So like if it's all zeros, then do something. Um, and jumping also costs cycles. So we can see, right, like we, we, we this, this also costs a bit, but what if, 
we, we, we guess. So this is the first cycle. And then immediately we just, we just take a, we just make some decision. We don't know if it's right or not, but we just guess whether or not we should take the branch or we should not take the branch. We guess the branch outcome, essentially. It could also be there. We could also just go uh, further. Um, so we could, like, we make some speculative um, decision. And we can see RDI is already loaded, so we don't need to wait for the, the memory latency anymore. Let's add three. Um, but now we have, again, we've kind of postponed the problem where, like, we don't know yet, but like at some point we're returning to something. At some point, like we didn't really like solve the problem because now we have to wait because someone else really wants to know. We can't speculate endlessly. Um, so we need kind of something else for this to become very useful, let's say. And this, we saw this earlier, right? Um, so this, this was our pipeline. So what if we made it bigger? <laughs> um, so if we have multiples of each uh, um, execution in a unit, or like each unit of your CPU, then you can call, uh, you can execute more things at the same time. And that's called a uh, superscalar architecture. Um, and a model CPU is probably like this. Um, and even then, that's oversimplification. Like this is like a high-level chart of how it could look like on like a Zen CPU, and you can see there's multiple of different units. It's not the same amount. There's different interconnects and whatnot. Um, so let's look at another example. We take two function, uh, we take two pointers, and we check both for null, and we load from both of them. Um, we, it's very straightforward from the from the code perspective. Again, let's check out the assembly. So this is all x86. I just for an example, but it would make like the, uh, the concepts uh, go well with other um, architectures too. So again, we have this test, and let's first imagine we're executing this like without superscalar uh, architecture. Um, we have the first like we didn't wait for memory; we just guess some some outcome, and we go again, and because what cycle could we be on now? We're still using our only load unit. We speculatively said, like, load this value. And now we need to load some other value, but, like, our load unit is busy. So we can't keep speculating because we're still waiting for that uh, first uh, load. Um, so let's repeat all of this with a superscalar CPU. So we make some decision. We just say, like, OK, that's it. We jump, our, we jump this way. Then here, again, do the same thing. Um, and notice we didn't need to wait at this point. We just kept going because we could schedule or like say like here, load this other value too. We do this in parallel essentially. So if we have no speculation and no superscalar um, architecture, then as you can see, like a little timeline down there would take like a total of 26 cycles. And if you have speculation, but no superscalar um, architecture, then it takes 20 cycles. Because you see, right, like we can take the first branch immediately, but the next, as soon as we want to take the next branch, we have to wait until the first load completes. And um, if we speculate and have superscalar execution, then we can load like we can do the, take the first branch, take the second branch, and then we're done after the second load actually happens. Now it's done. And that's a total of 14 cycles. And like, let's imagine we're missing the cache both times. So this becomes more important with like bigger latency windows. So like without it, 286 cycles. And with it would be a total of 144 cycles. So like that's quite a big decrease actually. So. But instruction level parallelism is useful for more than uh, just speculation. Um, here, you can see we have uh, a function that takes three integers and then assigns them to the members of this orange. Um, and if you look closely, like all of these instructions are all independent of each other. Let's look at, at in, 
bigger picture. Here we go. So, um, as you can see, the first one, this IMUL multiplication operation, happens on EAX, EDI, the next one on ECX, ESI, the next one on EDX and EDX. So, like, all of these are independent. So, like, this would take a total of 18 cycles. There's no, no, no unknown. It's just like, let's say, multiplication takes a couple seconds to, to happen. But if you can do all of them at the same time, because they're independent of each other, then suddenly it only takes uh, eight cycles in total. That's less than half the time. But of course, that assumes you have three arithmetic logic units, or like three things that can do this uh, in parallel. So earlier, we talked about predictions. Um, and if you squint very closely, you can see um, it's random. And, <laughs> um, and if you're predicting, you don't, you don't want it to be random. Um, so first we mine gold, uh, coal, then we mine oil, and now we mine that sweet, sweet user data. So what if your CPU learns from your behavior? Um, so we have this. Um, We have this very simple loop. I deconstructed it into like its parts, but you could, of course, write a more like cleaner code to represent this. So we take an integer, and then we loop. We have some condition to break out of it, um, and otherwise we do some addition. And you can see the code is fairly minimal. It produces. So and this is this is kind of like what's happening there. Like let's say this happens for a long time, and. Like, wouldn't it be nice, like, the last seven times we've been going to the same place? Like, what if we predict next time we are also going to that same place? Um, so, how? But, like, how can this happen? So, again, this is the same example, but I will press a little button to, like, show something. I will press this button. And um, now you can see there's just some more data that's shown on the left side. It's kind of like something like instruction addresses. We'll talk about them in a second. And then you can see this, like, byte things that look like hexadecimal on, uh, on top of the instructions. Um, and so let's say the thing at the top, that's what humans are reading. Like your CPU, you're probably not feeding it text. It, it likes something else better. It likes bytes a lot better, although text is also bytes, but <laughs> you get the idea. And this is, of course, this is, for example, on x86. This is the compiled sequence for this. Um, but you can see these labels. It says, like, jump less to this one label. But, like, down there, I'm not really seeing a label. And also, this label idea, is that a name mangling? Or, like, how does this happen? Um, not quite. So, for example, the jump we're doing is a short jump. There's different kinds of jumps in the, this instruction set. Uh, and the next byte encodes its relative location where it's going. It's saying, like, go five back or something. It's not, there's no label anymore. A label is just there to make it easier to read for us. Um, but like relative to what? Like how does the CPU know to go five back, five back from, from what? So um, this is called the PC program counter and also known as instruction pointer. And this is influenced by like address more addressing modes and other things. But it's not so important for now. Like this encodes one or some instruction address. Um, so imagine. You have a program as a long sequence. Like, imagine your program is a long sequence of operations. Do this, then do this, then do this. Um, and if you want to emulate this, like, we could kind of model it like this. We could say, like, give me this, like, stream of instructions, and I will do them. I will execute them. Um, and how do we keep track of where we are? Um, we can store, like, the, the, the registers as our own state, and then keep, uh, like, like ma maintaining this invariance of it, and, like, changing things as they're going, and like we, we have our state, for example, RP, this is an instruction pointer, is where we could uh, store things, this program counter. Um, of course, that's oversimplified. For example, that's the x86 uh, API. In hardware, it's even more complex um, um, because of register renaming and whatnot, but like just to get an idea of what, what it looks like. And again, this is the same program from earlier, and on the left, for example, I replaced the labels with like imaginary addresses. Um, on the top, you can see the program counter, and we can like can see like it's imagine it's just like keep it keeps looping, and this offset is random on the left because of ASLR and other things, um, and your program probably is more doing more doing more than just this loop, so the addresses also might be quite big because it's doing a lot of different things, 
Um, so this is the first anima uh, animation I made for this. Like the, I made this and then I realized it's super wrong. Um, because the program counter doesn't store where we are, it stores where we're going next. It stores the next instruction. Uh, and if you can see now, once we hit this jump instruction, like what should we write into this register? Like where should we go? Down here now you can see it, like what value should that be? Like either it goes up there or it goes it crosses past. And that's where this like speculation comes into play, where like we need to make some decision of what value to write in this, uh, into this register. All right. So first I want to talk about unconditional jumps. So like you always jump, but you're not sure where to go yet. Uh, for example, this is, we looked at inheritance earlier. Uh, it's a virtual class, we from base <laughs> class, some derived class, and then we take a function and takes one, and needs to figure out at runtime where to go. Um, and first we're fetching instruction address, and then we're jumping there. A simpler example would be this. So we have a function pointer we're taking, and now it generates just a jump. Um, and let's talk about this. So, so let's say we remember the current instruction address um, and the target instruction address. And a name for this could be, let's say, BTB, branch target buffer, um, because we want to like buffer values of like where to go and like want to make like this access shorter, like again, this latency thing. So turns out transistors are expensive. Um, but I mean, everyone and anyone that's looked for apartments in Munich knows that's one, there's one thing more expensive than transistors, um, and that's real estate. That's like space. Um, but like, <laughs> who am I kidding, right? Like all of it is expensive. Um, and <laughs> yeah, so if, especially if stuff is close to other stuff, then it becomes quite expensive. And the same thing is, uh, applies for your CPU, like especially in this like very core where the execution happens, right where the instruction uh, pipeline is. Um, just adding more registers and more, more transistors everywhere is quite hard and quite expensive and there's, <laughs> different trade-offs you have to make of latencies and access and whatnot. So this, this looks a lot like a key value table to me, and the current instruction address uh, is key, um, and the target instruction address is value. And storing the full, the, like, for a full key takes a lot of transistors, and even worse so, like looking up the whole thing, at, uh, like, it takes a lot of transistors to like, do this key lookup, because now we have a big space, we need to do certain things. So what if we shrunk down this like instruction address? So, but, but how do we do this? Well, like, we have, for example, we have six bytes worth of data, and we want to turn it into like one byte worth of data, which is like 40, uh, 48 ones and zeros. I want to make them less ones and zeros, like give you a little hint. Um, so like, if you apply this to a branch target buffer, then we only store a partial hashed address to instruction address. And there's of course one piece still missing, and that's conditional branch prediction. So let's say we encode it as like zero means not taken, one means taken, um, and then every time we hit it, like we, we remember what we did last time. But that's quite a problem with this. Um, there's lots of fluctuation, it's not very stable, um, and very quickly changes its mind. Um, so what textbooks usually recommend to do in that case is to, to use a saturating counter, for example, there's a two-bit saturating counter, and this helps reduce this like flip-flopping of like changing your mind all the time. And the upper two entries means you take the branch, the lower one means you don't take it, or like you predict it as not taken. Um, and each time you can only move one step. So like you can like make this window of like one small decision, doesn't change everything. Uh, can you make it arbitrary large? And then if you put all of this together, that's what we get. We have the current instruction address, we have the target instruction address, and we have some prediction about like whether or not to take a jump branch. Um, of course, there are more components involved, but it's the core idea. But at least I believe that at some point. Um, so when I was researching this, there was like this cycle that kept happening. So 
I'd go in with some vague understanding, and then I'd read some more, and then I'd feel like, oh yeah, now I understand it. Um, and then I'd read some more, and I'm like, wait a second. This, like then new logic holes opened up, and I'm like, the whole big picture doesn't fit anymore, and I have more questions. Then I read some more, and I'm like, ah, now I understand. Um, and you can imagine what happened next. Um, so this kept happening quite a bit with this. And I'm afraid we have to dig deeper, go a bit further to really understand what we're talking talk about, because the model I just showed is not going to be adequate for explaining what's, what's going to happen. So first, let's break it down to static uh, branch prediction. Um, for example, this means whether or not, like imagine you have never encountered a branch before. Then you don't have any past experience, and you just have to make some decision. And just to give you an idea, like how willing vendors are to talk about this, Intel is now willing to talk about Pentium 4 on their website, what they're, what they're implementing there. Um, and for example, this one does like a forward branch, defaults to like if you're going forward, you, you split these branches into forward and backward branches, and you say the forward ones, you, or you never take them by, by a static prediction, the backward branches, you always take them. Um, and on the flip side, we have dynamic branch prediction. Um, and that's what happens if you've encountered the branch before. And you remembered what happened last time. And let's look at the different kinds of branches, because it makes sense. This was a big aha moment for me when I like broke down the different kinds of branches. Um, there's two axes. There's one that's like, is the branch conditional? Like, do we know or not know whether or not we're going to take it? And um, is the target fixed? Do we know where we are going? So for example, for unconditional branch with a fixed target, we have something like a go to, a break, a continue. For a conditional branch with a fixed target, we have an if, logical operators. Uh, for an unconditional branch with a variable target, we have like function pointers, virtual calls. And for conditional branches with a variable target, we have like an if plus a function pointer or more. Um, so let's break them down each by each. Like let's look at each of these quadrants. And uh, this is the simplest one. You jump to a fixed instruction address, and this is how the caching looks like. Um, during instruction decode time, you know that you're going to jump, and you know where you're going to jump. So there's no unknowns involved. You don't need to cache or guess anything. Um, the current instruction address is part of like whether or not it's absolute or relative. It's part of the instruction stream, so you have that information. Um, so there is really no caching required. So let's look at this next one, at this like conditional, but like with a fixed target. Um, this is the most common type of branch. And you jump to a fixed instruction address um, based on a runtime condition. And for example, here, this J and E jump not equal, like jump if not equal. So we do some comparison, and then we jump. Um, and this is how it could be modeled. So like, there's no need to store a target because there's no target. Uh, that we don't know, like the target is part of the instruction stream again. Um, and let's also look at how we're storing history, because it turns out that's not how it's happening on modern hardware these days. Uh, they split into two conceptual parts. You have a local part that's like, how has this one specific branch behaved the last n times? And you have a global part that's, how have the last n branches behaved over time? And this can be encoded like this. Like, of course, the CPU is not storing like little t's, it's storing ones and zeros, but like for now, we're going to use t's and n's to make it easier to, to follow and understand. Um, and instead of storing this like saturating counter, we store like local and global history. So let's apply this. Yeah, OK, let's also look at this slide. So this is the reverse engineered uh, function for the Haswell BHB branch history buffer when it gets the state gets updated. And the thing I want to take home, you to take home, is not how it exactly it works. Like I'm not going to write a test, and like you need to like simulate what's the, real, the correct outcome. What I want you to take home is that there's more going on because it also takes the source and the target address in there. Um, so, but let's ignore this for now. Let's just say we store as part of the local history, we store the local history, and then we have some global buffer, this global history buffer, where we store like how the last n br branches behaved. Like not this one branch, but all branches together, the last n branches. Um, also notice we're not storing a hash. We're, we're storing a partial instruction address. 
uh, apparently like chopping off the lower bits is what they do usually because they expect branches to be close together. Um, and so you wouldn't jump crazy far and that would work well with these like predictions uh, thing. Um, so let's look at unconditional but variable target branches. They jump to like a runtime variable instruction. You can see this RDI that's in register some runtime non, uh, known thing. <laughs> And this is especially when you're doing runtime polymorphism, as we, we heard earlier. This is where the mechanism this gets implemented with. Um, and let's imagine the value that RDI is pointing to could be in main memory and uncached and could take a long time to figure out. So you want to cache this again, like to, to mitigate these latency issues to get more IPC. Um, and now we're storing a partial uh, address from where we are and a partial instruction address from of where we want to go. And we still have this global history buffer. Um, so while waiting for this target instruction until it's really loaded, we can already make some speculative, we can continue executing by providing something, some value for this program counter. We can provide this value and be like, okay, here, that's where we need to go. Um, but there's this kind of a problem here because this can only store for one branch, one possible target. And if you have a runtime conditional branch, if it only always goes to the same place, then it's not a very good uh, model because usually you use it if you want to go to different places. So somehow we would need to like uh, um, remember different places, um, but how? So like one idea would be we store different possible uh, uh, target addresses. So we have this one to n mapping, um, but it's kind of tricky because now you need some kind of like variable amount of bits or not for this value and then you need to do some kind of lookup and that's really nasty to do in hardware and slow. Um, so there's a, a different uh, approach that you follow and they do. That is to use this global history buffer. So they combine the global history buffer state with the lower bits of the instruction address to create a key. Because the idea is if your program took a different path along its execution, it might also go somewhere else. Um, and then you have different keys and values and the lookup is very fast and there's mapping, and immediate mapping. And so this BHB, this branch history buffer, which the GHB is a part of, is used for disambiguation to figure out where to go. Um, it's possible to have both. You can have an if and a function pointer together and a simple implementation would generate two jumps. So like the first jump would be, if it's not equal to 38, then we jump past this variable jump. But, and then if it's equal to 38, then we don't take the first jump, but we take the second jump. But that's, we can be a bit more clever and that's by inverting the condition, we can say like, if it is 38, then we jump to this variable uh, location. And then we put it all together and um, that's kind of what it would look like. So you need to find out like you have, you, you hit this point in code uh, during, in your execution and you want to keep speculating, you want to keep going and you don't know whether or not to go and you don't know where to go. But this buffer might have an answer for you and then you can keep going if there's an answer for you in there. Um, I mean, all we talked about is just conceptual. I mean, reality, of course, is much more complex. There's different parts involved. It's not in one table like I showed. Uh, there's more special case hardware, for example, loops are modeled differently. Um, but I guess from what we're going to talk about, the most important parts are there. Um, so <laughs> this, this is an exceedingly important graph, okay? So like, I will give you some moment to look at it. So there's two axes. One is whether or not something's shared, and the other one is whether or not it's uh, mutable. And like maybe for a second, let's also imagine a world where like not shared immutable is the default. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, so like back to this, there's four combinations, <laughs> and where do you want to be? Is there like a place you want to be on this? Is there a place you don't want to be maybe? Um, I, I feel like this is not like, I'm looking at you, I'm like not getting the message. You're like all sitting there like, oh, it's Thursday afternoon, Jesus Christ, he's still talking. So I gave you a bit more like a stronger message. So like on the left side, 
life's bangers, like really good. But like on the right side, it's not so great. And like this top corner, trust me, this is, this is where pain lives. This is, this is very nasty. Like I, I will, I'm willing to bet, like if you had very, very nasty bugs to debug, this is the corner where you were. This is <laughs> so this shared mutable thing, it's, this, this graph doesn't even only apply to like programming. I think it's fairly fundamental to other things too. Um, so this is our CPU again. Like how much shared mutable state is in there? Um, turns out quite a lot. And I didn't even get all of it on one slide. So like keeps going down there. Um, and I'm sure nothing bad will happen, right? Like, um, so like shared between who? This, this is a question on Stack Overflow from 2012. Uh, and, and there's one sub question and there's like, what happens to RSB when context switch happens? And RSB is, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then the same day OSGX answers, I think return stack buffer resets at, con at context switch. And then two years later, someone answers, Matt G says, as I understand it, the RSB is unaware of context switches. So people are talking about this, but it's not very obvious. Um, and there's one nice thing in that. It's like, will it just be wrong and mispredict upon context switch? And I'm like, will it just be fine? Um, so like, tune in again next week and you'll find out the answer. So that's it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I knew the little bar would give it away. It's kind of, an, you're not believing me, but like, who has the time for this, right? Like, we have Netflix autoplay next episode, so like, no, no, no one has the time for this. Um, all of this, what we're gonna see involves, involves shared microarchitectural state. So between the user and the kernel execution on the same CPU, between processes on the same CPU, between guests and their hypervisors, between execution on simultaneous multithreading or CPU siblings, and this, there's more, it's just the ones that are kind of important, relevant for what, what we're doing. So like, remember this thing, so like, uh, what if we, we, um, we attack the table? And if you're wondering how I got this image, I was looking for warrior. This is what, 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 what CC reuse gives you. So um, what if, anyone willing to bet what I like to guess what I'm alluring to you? Bang, bang. <laughs> Okay, maybe a bit too much bang. Um, as I've seen before, we have this global history buffer state and we combine it with an instruction address and we get this key for our hash table. Um, and we could also say, for example, we, we execute a series of always taken branches and this way the, this result can be influenced. And so let's imagine we execute this like series of always taken branches, and then we call into a hypervisor. Um, bang. <laughs> so like a little a collision happened, but like, so what? So for the next part, I need two volunteers who wants to come to the front. I have, I have a physical demonstration I'm doing. And really, I need two volunteers. Yeah, Klaus, look, he's, oh, I have two brave people. So like, these are two places. Um, and I wrote them down on like little pieces of paper. Come here, come, you go to come here. So I once, I have Tierisch Mir and I have, <laughs> I will not try to pronounce it. Um, and I will give each of you one of these papers. I'll give you this one, okay. I'll give you this one and go, show the, go to the front here and keep it closed, keep it okay. closed. You have to keep it closed. No, no, keep it I closed. Yeah, you have to, no, no, you have to close it. To close it, sorry. Yes, yes. And I will turn around, yeah. and then you can decide to exchange it or not to exchange it. Okay. Or, you, or you can decide to exchange it three times, up to you. At some point, when you're done exchanging, you will tell me, okay? I will turn around, I will not look, I cannot see, okay? okay. And everyone that's saying I have a mirror, that's also not true, I don't have a mirror. Okay, okay. So, no, no, you have oh, okay. to, yeah, you, okay. I, I, I'm guessing you have Tirish Mir. But, but how did I know this? I can't look inside. <laughs> <laughs> so, so give, give me the paper. So how did I guess correctly? Am I a magician? Do I know really good tricks? 
Um, like turns out, um, by knowing, thank you, uh, by knowing all the options available and looking at like the length of the paper, I do not need to know, look inside and I can still know the answer. Like who, who got what or if they exchanged it and whatnot. Um, this visibility obfuscation is defeated by, by the length of like how long the paper was or like how long the name was. Um, and maybe I can hold it into the light and I can see it. all of these are like side channels that are like defeating what's happening here. And by the way, if you think that was not a real place, <laughs> that's a real place in New Zealand. Um, so let's do a digital example. And so like, let's imagine you're like kind of curious and you want to know what your sheeps are doing. Um, and you know that some sheep like installing packages from the Ubuntu app repository. And like, you know that exactly one package has the size of 952,444 bytes. And now this one server sends a package 952,440 bytes, but it's encrypted. Sends it to one of your sheep, and you're like, huh, I wonder what's inside. Um, all of this is called, uh, called side channels. So like the algorithm of what you're doing might not be wrong, but by implementing it, somehow it, it leaks or breaks and doesn't work properly anymore. Um, and there's some meta information, and like usually, this happens as soon as you touch reality. Like usually, if you implement some abstract thing and then you put it in reality, side channels happen. And from what we can tell, that's not going away. It's just staying. This is <laughs> some seems to be some fundamental truth or like property of uh, like how we interact with our universe. Um, and this creates unintended information channels. As we've seen here, the, the idea was I could be we fold it. I can't see it, but still I knew what happened. And a very common side channel is timing. Um, so like, how long does it take uh, for something to happen? So especially, for example, these, these cash access, for, for example, we saw earlier, of like whether or not these like little villages had to go to the town center or like go like to this place next to it, we can figure that out afterwards by looking how long stuff happens, because it's a very noticeable side effect. And so let's take code like this. We, we have a user-controlled index, but we're good programmers, I, I swear. We do a bounce check, and then we use that value, this, we use this first index to compute an index for another array, and then we load a value from that. Um, and we also, like no undefined behavior, every value inside array one is a valid index into array two. Let's, let's say you add speculation. Um, so it means this could, like, your CPU might speculatively execute this with any possible number because it guessed the bounce check wrong. Um, and if you add a side channel, so let's say, yeah, I speculated wrong, okay, but like, I'll clean up, or there will be, but like, do you also clean up all the side effects, all the shared mutable state? Um, yeah, fuck. <laughs> So let's, let's look at this um, again, like how is this possible? Uh, let's look at this example. So let's, this is our imaginary mo memory model. And we have two arrays in there. And we can, these, these arrows, they point at where something is, not what it is. Um, and because this bounce check could be wrong, this first thing could go to any possible location after uh, array one or inside array one too. Um, let's look at an example. Let's fill in some numbers. Let's, maybe it's easier to grasp that way. Um, so we have an index up there. There's like 513,344. And that is out of bounds. But this code is still being executed speculatively on your CPU. Uh, and that has some value. And then we use that value to index into the second array. And that also has some value that's loaded. And these red arrows, they, they tell you where a value is in memory, not what it is. So like, of course there's some, some things missing. That's why when values get loaded, they get loaded by the prefetcher uh, into cache. And then you have something, you have a cache line there because it doesn't load just one value, it loads a series of values. Um, and these are observable. You can tell where a cache line is, even though it's not your cache line, for example. Um, And this cache, this is shared mutable state. And 
I'm telling you, this is really this is the evil in this world, shared mutable state. Um, but but what, what? So what? Okay, we, we loaded some value and some other wrong value, but like just the first load by itself it can tell us, okay, maybe there is a value or not, but it's not super useful. We're not yet reading all of the, the memory. Um, the second load, this is where it becomes really interesting. The, we use this first value as an index into a second array. So by virtue of like where the second load is, it tells us the value of the first one. Let's, let's have a little animation for this. So you can see we're just incrementing the index. It's still out of bounds, it's past array one, um, and we get some value. And this first value, this cache line stays where it is, but the second cache line moves around because it's dependent on the value of the first thing. So by knowing where the second cache line is, we can figure out what the first value is, the starter dependent index, and with that we can read arbitrary memory. Uh, and this is called a universal read gadget. Um, in this context, we're gonna talk about. I'll give you a second. And again, these red arrows, they just point to where it is, not, not what the value is. So I'm curious who feels they, they understood this now? Uh, who, who? <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, that's not a no yet. So who feels like they understood what, what I'm talking about? That's a, that's a good amount of people because this is really tricky. And like, I wish when I learned this, I had this animation that told me how it worked. <laughs> it was quite a lot of head banging to like get us to, to, to like, and even then, like when I was doing it, I was like, wait a second, is it this or this? And then, okay, so I, <laughs> the world is great and beautiful. Um, um, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, um, so again, back to this thing. So let's set up some colliding value before we switch security context. And, but in order to cause these collisions, we need to know the collision target, what we want to make collide. Um, and you can leak influ you can leak information in both ways. You can leak information from the victim, the thing you're attacking, back to you. And you can also, so that's, that's the first part. You need to figure out, okay, what is the thing I wanna collide with? And then you can influence the branch prediction, that's the other way around, so the victim speculatively executes uh, this, this gadget. We'll talk about it in a second. So like the first stage of this attack would be, um, so you're observing, like you're, 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 you're calling into the hypervisor, for example, um, and you're observing when, you, when it comes back to you, your own branch predictions and mispredictions. And that tells you what it was doing before it gave you control back. And this, you can repeat doing this um, until you know enough of an address. And then you can start causing these branch prediction collisions. But, so like in first way, you, you, you get some information and you're like, ah, okay, so that's what you're doing. And then you start using that to like influence what's happening. So like you set up, these variable targets, like you do this like series of, of always taking conditional jumps to like get more, uh, more reliable results. And then you can effectively make the other program jump around as you feel like. Speculatively, but it jumps around the program as you want it to jump. And there's something called uh, ROP, Return Oriented Programming. We don't have the time to talk about it, but the idea is that in every sufficiently complex program, I'm pretty sure yours is, there is an interpreter in there, and you can execute arbitrary code inside of other programs, even though it was never built in, never programmed in. So you can use this influencing of where to jump to speculatively build up little gadgets to execute this universal read gadget we saw earlier, even though it might not even be programmed into the program. You can make it, like you can interpret it essentially, and like turns out, the, the speculation windows on modern hardware is big enough for this to work. So like we're talking hundreds of instructions. Um, and then you get to read arbitrary hypervisor memory, like for everyone that thinks, okay, it's not so bad. That means like if you're running on a cloud service, someone else is reading your memory. That's really bad. Um, and this, for example, is the write-up, for example, for this. And it's, it's, what we talked about is like a high-level overview of the Spectre V2 proof of concept. Um, of course, the precise proof of concept is more complex, um, and it assumes it, you know a lot of concepts. For example, it never explains ROP, just isn't there, and there's a lot going on, but 
But I believe after the talk today, I gave you the fundamentals of when you would read this, like from the speculation side, you'd feel at home. You'd understand what's happening. Um, so let's talk about mitigations. What can be done against this? Um, this is quite complex. It's a very complex state machine. There's a lot going on. This is a very simplified image. There's like five of these and there's more and uh, whatever. So there's software that's running all of this. And it's running, it's implementing these instructions. So it's called not code, it's called microcode. Um, we, we all saw these micro instructions earlier, this micro architectural state, there's always this micro thing. Um, and there's software that's running all of this and it can be patched via microcode updates. Uh, and what they did is they added new instructions. Actually, yeah, okay, you see it's a bit wrong over there. But um, they patched them in via microcode and they control, essentially they control how this shared mutable state of this branch predictor is used between security contexts. So when you do a context switch and whatnot, you could call these instructions, but they're not automatically, like the programmer has to insert them into their program via some automatic way or some manual way, but they allow them to say like, oh yeah, discard these results, or like don't give him access to my, like, to my results. Um, but it turns out it's quite slow on current hardware because the current hardware was never designed to model this. They, they didn't know it when building this, this CPUs. They had no idea this was what, what they should be, do at, uh, should be doing at some point. Um, the idea is that it should get better in the future. Once CPUs are built, that are built specifically now with this in mind, then this should become much cheaper and better. But for current hardware, there's still a lot of CPUs. We're talking, these bugs are there for more than 10 years. So like we're talking 10 years of Intel, ARM, AMD, and MOS processors that have these bugs. That's a lot of hardware. Um, so let's, let's look at this. <laughs> yes or no, maybe. The, I don't know what's happening. It's still loading. Just the person with the, with the Wi Fi on spot. <laughs> Want to check the Wi Fi hotspot? Oh, yes. Mm. So we have this highly complex function. Um, but, like, turns out there's an indirect branch here. I was a bit surprised too, but there's an indirect branch here. Um, there's an unconditional variable target jump. Hmm. There were only two instructions, so one of them, it had to be one of them. Ah, mouse. So let's imagine this program. So we're calling printf a couple times, maybe some debug printfs or whatever. Printf is compiled once. Let's say printf is compiled once into libc. Um, how does it know where to return into your program? It can't know at compile time because there's multiple places and there's, it's only compiled once. So somehow it has to figure out where to return to. Um, how does it know where to return to? So let's look at a Simpler example, is that it already? Yeah, that's a simplified example. Yeah. You can appreciate the blank screen for whatever it means. Um, so if you've ever wondered how to compute oranges, we get an integer as an, uh, as an argument we call this orange function, which also returns an integer. Then we do some multiplication, call the orange function again, and then we return. Um, all right. So this is the same one, this is the same code. And I gave some example implementation for orange. It returns the value 435, super simple. Um, and it, there's no inlining because I want to have this call here, right? Like it's imagine it's a different translation unit or something. Um, so, Let's look at it in action, what's happening. So you can see, okay, we're doing the, the call, then it goes down there, and then it just, just keeps looping, right? But every time we hit this return, we need to go back. And what if every time we hit a call, we remember the current instruction address we're at, like the things on the left, right? There's some meta information, they're not actually there, but this is some, some meta information of what's happening. And the CPU knows about it. Imagine like an X, like an index into an array or like a vector. The, the element doesn't know which element it is, 
but if you know, then there's some information about meta information, what's happening. And this, this instruction address, let's say every time we do a call, we remember the call, this instruction address, and every time we do a return, we um, use that last remembered thing. So what could a data structure that models this? Um... <laughs> so this is a stack, or like last in, first out, leave for. So every time we make a call, we, we put on this instruction address, and then we do a return. Um, and because there's no need to search, we can store the full instruction address. So there's no collisions or anything here. So <laughs> finally, <laughs> um, the hardware mitigations are expensive on current hardware, so maybe we can do better in the software. Um, <laughs> this is what someone had to say on like the Graal JVM mailing list. Um, And it doesn't even need to be a JIT compiler. It does, can just be any compiler. It's very easy to do this code transformation. It's a very straightforward code from that transformation. It can be implemented in a compiler. Oh. Still compiling, but okay, we have this, this, uh, function again that takes a function point and calls it. Um, and this is, so we add this, this flag, red boolean, um, and then this code that's generated changes. We generate different code for that same pattern. Um, and there's a lot going on here. Um, you move the destination, that's an RDI, into our, our end register R11, we do a fixed jump, we do a call, uh, we do a stack smash, and then we stop speculating. And let's look at it in detail, because the first time I saw this, I was very confused and didn't know what's happening. Um, so the red arrow, as it's moving, that's the speculation. And the blue one, that's uh, the um, real execution, if you want to call it. Um, so maybe let's talk about this block in the middle first. There's like pause, elephants. Um, pause, apparently, is the cheapest and most efficient way to stop speculating on Intel. And LFANS works both on uh, Intel and AMD. So essentially when the speculation somehow gets there, it stops. It doesn't keep going further. But how does it get there? So like, we do this call, that you, this green call and this return. And this return, stack, this return stack buffer that we just looked at, this data structure, that's the stack. Um, that's what it predicts. It doesn't expect a stack smash that's happening right before the return. Um, so it speculates, we will go to the next instruction after the call, which is this pause instruction. So it speculates, oh yeah, that's where we're going. But once the real execution, like so the next specula speculation stops, and then the real execution keeps going, so at some point, like the memory load happens. Like it's really done. Like we're, we're not speculating anymore, like we have the real memory, and then the stack smash happens, we're overwriting this RSP, the return stack pointer. We're essentially writing the value that's originally in RDI, writing into R11, and R11 then into RSP in the return stack pointer. And that means this return goes to where we actually wanted to go, and not, there's no misspeculation anymore at this point. Uh, and if you wonder why are we doing this jump, the first jump, that's to deduplicate code. Like if we would compile this pattern into every uh, um, variable target jump, that would be quite a bit of binary bloat. So they made a decision to like add this code once somewhere, and then every time they jump to this pattern, to this red pulleen, this return trampoline, um, how it's called. And you can see it's using this trampoline, this return to trampoline the speculative execution into a trap, essentially, into like, you can't go any further there, or that can't do harm. So like, let's imagine like a weirder machine. Uh, was this already the, oh yeah, we looked at the wrong thing the whole time. Did we look at the right thing? Doesn't matter, okay. So, um, so yeah, let's, let's, this is Intel once, okay. So we can see the speculation, uh, it goes up and then it stops. And like on a weirder machine, for example, let's imagine pause and elephants don't work properly. Um, you can see the speculation just keeps going, but it's a jump, there's an endless loop there. So it just is stuck in an endless loop. And at some point we do the stack smash and then it's like, oh yeah, I shouldn't be there. And then the speculation gets discarded, essentially. Uh, GCC also has this functionality with a wonderful um, uh, option. 
it's indirect branch equals Splunk extern because I'm sure they will have seven different indirect branch options in the future. Um, and your up-to-date kernels, like if, you, if you're using a Windows, a Linux kernel, FreeBSD, whatever, it's compiling with something like this, very probably. Because, yeah, I, I want to do some very, very basic threat modeling. And essentially, I want to help you answer the question, do I have a problem because of this? Like, we just talked about like something that sounded very, like, uh, serious, we need arbitrary memory, kernels and hypervisors and whatnot. Um, again, this is very, very basic, and we're only doing it for Spectre v2, uh, variant 2. And of course, feel free to talk to me offline. You can talk about this, about other uh, Spectre-related things. So, is there something to steal? So, like, we could argue about salt economics, but does your system have any confidential data? Is there something, like fundamentally, if there's nothing to steal, you don't need to care. Um, is there someone to steal, right? Does your system interact with like untrusted services or inputs? Um, and fundamentally, if there's no one that wants to steal, you don't need to care. Um, are you executing untrusted code? Um, if you are executing untrusted code in the same address space as some, as some confidential, confidential data, for example, then the only effective solution so far, not because of this, but because of some other Spectre-related problems, is to separate all of the confidential data into some other process and have some very limited uh, inter-process communication that doesn't suffer these problems. Um, that's what browsers are doing these days. So, for example, these bugs could be used to read the values like the cache, like the, the cookies, for example, from different web pages and whatnot, because you could read the whole, pro, the whole memory of the whole browser from every tab, essentially. And um, this one was fixable with this one, uh, this one uh, compiler flag, but other problems essentially made it impossible. So, are you implementing an operating system or hypervisor? And if you're, operating, if you're implementing something like this, you can mitigate Spectre v2 quite, forward, quite straightforwardly with this compiler switch, and then this one specific problem is gone, um, or in the future with like hardware support and whatnot. So, we talked about Spectre variant 2, aka branch target injection, which makes a lot of sense. We have some target, we're injecting other targets into it into these branch targets. And we only did threat modeling for this. So there's a curious hole there, right? Like Spectre variant one. This is the most well-known one. This is uh, much, much trickier to mitigate. Uh, essentially, right now, no one knows how to do so effectively. You could say, let's turn off all speculation, which is an option, but now your program runs 10 times slower. If that's okay for you, okay. But like for a lot of people, that's not okay. Um, because we're essentially giving away, like we're throwing away all the optimizations that happened since like the last 10 years or more in CPU research, because as we've seen, we can't flick the switch any faster, so they had to find some other mechanisms to like improve this IPC, and speculation was the main uh, way they went. Oh, and also cache architectures and whatnot, but like, this is not really, this, there's, there's still a lot of unknowns there where to go with this in the future with Spectre variant one. Um, this is also called like bounce check bypass or just Spectre, this one, first one. And that's all we talked about. And I mean, shared mutable state, what could go wrong? Um, <laughs> yeah, oops. Um, all this information can be quite overwhelming and it doesn't help that all of these have multiple names. I just chose one name and try to be consistent, but it's really hard. So for example, Spectre variant three up there, it's also known as Meltdown. It's also known as Rogue Data Cache Load. So like you have all these different exploits and they have their own implications and mitigations. They have different names and can be quite overwhelming. Um, I'm not sure, wait. Ah, now the shell came here, okay. So let me execute this uh, command, lscpu. And down here we can, for example, we can see all these vulnerabilities that are listed. And we have different ones, what's happening. And for example, here for Spectre variant two, we can see 
mitigation, full generic repolene, and then these instructions. And there's back here, that's also quite important, but we're not talking about this. Um, and there's much more you can see. Also some, for example, I'm not affected by this, but it's like tra transaction abort problem. And earlier, all these addresses that we, that we looked at, they were uh, 48 bits or six bytes. And why did I choose this one specific value? And that's because on most desktop hardware um, these days, you get 48 bits of virtual address space, like your kernel is implementing and saying like, okay, get 48 bits that are addressable. Um, so this is the 48 lower bits of your pointer will be used. That's why some people do pointer tagging and whatnot. And on hardware, to like be more efficient, to, to use less registers, less transistors and whatnot, um, there's even less, for example, on this machine, even if I somehow physically could attach like 200 terabytes of memory, it wouldn't work. Even though like my kernel is like, yeah, I understand it, but my hardware is like, no. Um, so, let's go back to this. Um, all the cycle numbers that you looked at are fictional. Um, they are kind of in the ballpark, ballpark of what's happening, so for example, <coughs> Loading memory can be slow, can take a long time. Um, adding is very fast. Taking a branch is more expensive than doing an addition usually. Um, and I mostly chose these specific numbers for an ease of understanding. So like, don't get too attached with the numbers I just showed, okay? Also there's all these different kinds of hardware. I couldn't like show all of them at once. Um, and I mean, all of this is really fascinating. Like, but I'm, um, at the same time, I'm willing to bet that your company or what you're involved with has much more mundane security issues than this. So <laughs> maybe, maybe not him, but security is a pr process, okay? So like repeat with me, security is a process. So if someone is selling you security as a whole package, you are being scammed. Um, Ransomware, like we've been hearing ransomware and ransomware, and like they don't use these like crazy clever exploits. You know, you want to know how they hack your company? That's how they hack your company. Um, like they, they tell the user here, please press this big box, and then the machine keeps working. You're used to it, like you always have to uh, press the big button, so now please press the big button. Um, and the user doesn't understand the machine anyway. It doesn't understand it when it's supposed to press yes or no. Like these boxes up here, they press the box and then it keeps going. Like that's the pattern they've learned, right? Like this is what we've been teaching them for like a lot of years. So um, I, I read about this uh, researcher and he was invited by one company to figure out like how easily uh, their employees are fishable, like, uh, like via emails. And they had 30,000 employees. So they were like, oh yeah, nice. Let's do some, uh, like some research. So they tried six different methods of teaching the people beforehand to not be fished. Um, and they had one control group, of course, that didn't get any like training beforehand or educational material. They tried a lot of things and they figured out they had all of the six different methods had zero measurable impact. 30% still clicked, yeah, here, please reset your password. There's this funny URL, they enter their password. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, I believe as an industry, we need to stop blaming the users because 30 years ago, we had word macro problems and we told them like, oh yeah, don't click the button, but like, we're still here. Clearly it doesn't work. Like if anyone knows this, like uh, this, this um, uh, Richard Feynman's talk or like text about like the planes are not landing, like the planes are not landing, like this, things haven't changed. We, clearly we need to change the, uh, like what we're doing. Um, so I think something very similar applies in this situation, where like if the CPU vendors are expecting us to write programs within, and keeping in mind the invariants, things, programming patterns, everything in there that we never programmed in, if they're expecting us to like write programs with, while keeping in mind that our invariants, the one we programmed in, are not even holding, that's insane. Like this is not tenable. Like I'm not, I, I'm pretty sure this is not gonna work because I know a lot of people that are programming and they're struggling with the invariants they program. Like how are they gonna supposed to like think about the invariants they're not even programming in? Like if the stuff like doesn't hold the bounce checks, everything. So I believe this has to be fixed in hardware, uh, all of these uh, speculation problems. Um, 
So please, please reach out. If you have any chance to talk to a CPU vendor, tell them that it's not our fault. Like they should not be blaming us because it doesn't work. We'll, we'll get it wrong again and again. Um, so maybe on a final note, um, all I want is a secure system where it's easy to do anything I want. Is that so much to ask for? <laughs> it's XKCD, you can find it online. You don't need to picture. <laughs> Everyone done in reading? Like still boxes you haven't done yet? It doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, you have questions. So read is a microcooler. Is it part of the kernel or it's No, it's part of the CPU. Yeah, yeah. It's the, um, so where does the microcode run? It's not part of the uh, kernel. The kernel can apply it, can be like here, load some new signed blob. Um, and it's part of the firmware and there's even more than one firmware. There's different layers. So like there's, apparently there's ring zero, one, two, three for like the user land. But we've been talking about, for example, at ring minus one, ring minus two. There's like a whole web server running below like your instruction address and like the management engine and there's other stuff in there. So like, it, it looks like this x86 interface, but there's a lot of ugliness below and like it's firmware, so it's like a lot of ugly C. <laughs> so this also has a lot of problems. Um, yeah, but it's a talk for a different time. So um, it's really common to say that most of the time CPU is doing nothing, it's just idle. Yeah. Is it, yeah. Uh, this idle time, does it include the microcode running or is it just, I mean, this, okay, so does, it's only about so there was an observation that uh, your CPU is waiting a lot most of the time. Yes, that's true, especially if you have something like a, let's imagine like a Python or Node.js program, like your CPU is waiting most of the time, probably even maybe with a CPU C++ program, right? It's easy to, to uh, fall into these traps because it's very, very complex and um, to always keep it fed, like your CPU can, uh, can uh, crunch through uh, what was it, like hundreds of gigabytes of memory per second can execute billions of instructions. And like, if you look at something, right, like you open a chat message, a chat, and then you, you press the box and it takes like one and a half seconds or like your Jira ticket, I don't know. And like, that's, uh, we're talking several hundreds of billions instructions worth of time and it managed to show this box, okay. So like, clearly there's some inefficiency there and like there's this good saying where like all CPUs or all computers wait equally fast so it doesn't matter if you throw a faster CPU at it. Um, and the observation was like what's happening then? Is the, is the CPU, the microcode also stalling? Um, I don't know exactly but what I would imagine is that um, this like loading like the other memory, memory still and like interop in this like whole pipeline and discarding the speculation so that's even though your CPU might be idling, there might still be a bit running, but it really probably the answer is it depends. But I don't know for, for certain. I would have to look it up. Thanks for the talk. It's great. Um, just a question. What are the security implications of uh, disabling the management engine? <coughs> what are the security implications of disabling the management engine? So there is a team. Uh, at just the Google Core Boot team, I think. Well, it's a dip, they're part of a different team and they just do Core Boot. So the idea is exactly that. You're like you're turning off all these features in the CPU because it doesn't end there. Like you need to turn off a lot more. Um, the idea is it's beneficial, but it's tricky. And because all of this is undocumented, like CPU vendors, they don't want to talk about this. Uh, because like getting good branch prediction means having a competitive advantage is one of their most well-kept secrets. Yeah. Uh, one common question is about the CPU. Um, you can't really disable it because you're trying to use own processors or multiple own processors within the, within the CPU. So the observation is you can't turn it off, but that's not true. There are flags you can pass and when you oh, boot. Part, you can disable parts. No, but you can pa pass flags and then you can get rid of certain parts, but it's, you always have to like reverse engineer what's actually happening because there's no documentation you can read for this. Or some of it is documented, but 
it's it's muddy, right? There's no clear answer. Turn this one thing off or off. I, like it's it's a big complex topic. I don't think we have the time to talk about all of it here. Do you know if there are any research uh, about other parts of the CPU? Uh, if common shifts save uh, kind of uh, errors, uh, for example, in uh, data path acceleration or in uh, GPU interaction and so on, because we not just execute code on the CPU. So the observation is, did we look, or like did people look into other places? Yes, every red part here is a, is a vulnerability, is, a, is an exploit. Uh, and there's more, right? Like it could only get so many on the screen. Like you see one line that doesn't have something and that maybe we just haven't found it yet, right? Um, this is over the last two years that all of this has been found, the last three years essentially. Um, so there's more to come, definitely, and there's also stuff missing here. Um, so yes, GPUs are even worse because they don't even do a lot of these things properly. They, they just say like, yeah, you have to get it right. That's a different like model of expectation. Um, the part about like the CPU mostly doing not CPU things, I didn't quite follow, but let's talk about it offline, okay? Yeah, I think that's it, so. Thank you.